So uh, welcome. My name is Paul Gronke and welcome to another in our series of Resilient Election Talks. Uh, Resilient Elections features talks that focus on research that can help improve and ensure a safe, secure and accessible election in 2020 and beyond. We're highlighting new cutting edge research, policy relevant research and emerging problems in election administration and reform rising out of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're trying to demonstrate and the value and lay out successful pathways to academic and administrative partnerships to help identify resilient solutions for election administration. This is what we hope that Mike Alvarez at the Voting Technology Project, who unfortunately can't be with us today, and myself, Paul Gronke at the Early Voting Center at Reed College, hope can be our contribution to a resilient election system in 2020 and beyond. I'm happy to be joined today by three guests. Steve Trout, the Director of Elections for the State of Oregon. Erica Haas, the Systems Engineer and Technical Liaison at ERIC, the Election Electronic Registration Information Center and Paul Manson, the research director at EVIC and a PhD candidate in the Mark Hatfield School of Government at Portland State University. Welcome everyone. Thanks for having us. Hello. So I'm gonna start with you, Steve, and I wanna share an anecdote about you and I uh, talking, well, overlapping at a conference at MIT. It was sponsored in December of 2017, and we both sat and watched a performance, a uh, 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 presentation by Michael Alvarez and Sylvia Kim about a performance audit that they had completed in or Orange County, California. Steve, you came up to me rather excitedly after that event and said, look, Paul, do you think something like this can be done in Oregon? Maybe you'd like to share a little bit about what about Mike's work with Sylvia attracted you uh, as the Director of Elections in Oregon and a longtime expert in the field, and what you hope to get out of this study, which eventually um, was completed in the state of Oregon. No, thanks. It, uh, I was excited. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about elections um, and audits and elections um, pretty much since 2016. It's really been a focus. And um, my concern was usually those discussions about election audits were just about uh, the, the ballots and the tally machines post-election. And there's so much more to elections that, uh, that go into that. And so I'd really been thinking and you know, having a desire to do more of a comprehensive election audit, more of the entire process, the voter registration database, making sure that uh, we could show the transactions there and, and what's coming in and, and what wasn't, uh, making sure that voters are assigned to the correct precincts. And just looking at the entirety of the election process instead of just at the, uh, at the, at the vote tally systems. And so, um, you know, that was really an, an exciting thing for me to be able to kind of move forward and, and audit the entire election system. The other piece of it is, um, you know, like I said, we've been doing post-election audits, uh, you know, manual tallies to, to check on the machines for a long time. Um, and, um, you know, we have confidence in that process. Uh, the public doesn't really know what we do or, or understand it. And, and I think part of the purpose of auditing is to, to build public confidence. And what I really liked about, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Caltech and Orange County um, program was that there was graphs and, and uh, images that people could look at and, and see that, uh, you know, something that was easier for them to understand as far as what's going on in, in the election registration database. And, and, uh, and, and I think that's an important piece when we talk about auditing is to do it in a way that uh, the public can understand because, you know, in my view, there's really two purposes for an audit. One is to, you know, make sure that the right things happen, but the second is to build public confidence. And so I think, um, you know, being able to graphically demonstrate what was going on with the voter registration database um, helps to tell that story and helps the public to have a better understanding of it. Absolutely, and thanks, Steve. And, and Eric, if I could turn to you for a moment. Um, I recall that you and I discussed this project when we were sitting down with your daughter over a couple bowls of Japanese noodles in Washington, D.C. And I mentioned to you that I was involved in, uh, in this project in the state of Oregon, how exciting it was, um, and how we had learned how the system ha had originally been developed uh, in, 2000, in 2000s after HAVA, um, and that we were kind of navigating through some of the complexities of the system. And you, you sort of leaned in and told me that you were part of the design team that, uh, that responded to an RFP for the current system in 2004. Now, you've moved on since then. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but I'd like to, if you can uh, think back to that period, what were you thinking about as you were trying to think about the design expectations 
for a statewide voter registration system, which was a requirement of HAVA, the first statewide registration system, but also designing one in the really the only state at that point that was a fully vote by mail. What kind of things were going through your mind? What kind of unique expectations were there, if there were any? And sort of tell us a little bit about that period of reform in voter registration, since we may be entering another period now in response to the changes that are occurring is in response to COVID. Sure. Well, and I, if I recall that story, uh, you were like, these tables are weird. And I was like, yeah, I worked on those. Um, so, so that was a really fun story. And it was a, a good time to, to read tables, a little bit. The, all of the data tables, right? That were, yes, there, there are many things in the Oregon system. Many. That surprised <laughs> to encounter. There were jury expectations, things in there that, that you told me at the time. This was a requirement that was needed at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was really interesting. I mean, when I look back, I think about just how naive I was really. <laughs> um, I had worked on a, a mid-size Oregon County, um, really the company that I worked for at that time, Helion Software. Uh, we were mostly involved because we had great relationships with the Oregon clerks. We uh, maintained software really more for the, the clerk recording side of the house. Um, so we had good relationships and we partnered with several different companies to really make that that go and and you know thinking back to the time of it um i remember you know we we were this tiny little company and we were you know putting together this massive R rfp and that's maybe the thing that's the most striking about it is those rfps were huge they included modules about yeah jury selection and uh, man you know, managing the election doing voter registration and ballot management um, polling place management at that time there were still laws on the Oregon books that still had polling places even though nobody was actually using them at that time and and you had to check off every box uh, and at that in the time when we were doing those um, you know, preparing for those RFPs you know I'm scientifically coding this this demo and um, one one thing that really sticks out is we were competing against against Accenture and they that particular time um, were sponsoring a Super Bowl and I was like I am just this from this tiny little company and we're going against someone who's sponsoring the Super Bowl and yet we ultimately got that RFP and and um, and really just looking at the requirements and when, and when you're trying to describe how you can meet them is one thing and then when you actually get it you actually have to get all the way through that really into the detail and and maybe what's the most um, interesting, I don't know, hard. Uh, my life was crazy at that time because it was there was so much work to be done. But that humongous RFP that they had to have little roller carts to roll around still did not describe the complexity of what a registration system and really a full election system um, is. So, you know, and, and when I really look back, I think about, you know, it's super exciting. I get to do something from the ground up. It's something that hadn't been done before. Um, well, it had in places, but not in Oregon. Uh, and it's really uh, kind of a developer's dream to get to make something from the ground up, from um, you get to design it all the way from you know, your imagination. And, and I love that. But now I look back and think, you know, you just didn't know what you, know, you can't know what you don't know. Uh, and so there were plenty of things. If I were to look at this now, I would design something different entirely. There's certainly pieces that I think um, have stood the test of time, but um, you know, it's 16 years in. Um, I have a great mark. Uh, I, my daughter was born right at that same time. And so she's just turned 16. So I know the exact age of Oregon system, um, but it's a, it's a totally different thing now. And I think um, around, uh, around the nation now, we know a lot more about how, what could be and what we didn't know then. I, I, lo I love that metaphor, Erica. Uh, so Sam is in, at, at a teenager now with all of the promise and the difficulties. And Paul Manson, I see yeah. from our chat window, Paul, you'd like to do a follow-up question? Sure. Yeah, Erica, I think one of the, um, we had some conversations as we were doing the report with Steve's office. And um, I'd be curious sort of your experience as you move then on and, and share a little bit about the Electronic Registration Information Center, but also how do you think about that data now or, or how states access that data and what's changed? Sure, well, so Eric, uh, as we call it, and of course I get the best uh, mnemonic with Erica from Eric, but um, I get to see data from all over the nation, right? We have uh, 30, 30 states plus DC now. And so 
I get to both see uh, information that comes from Oregon system, but also multiple other states uh, purchased basically that same base system that we were designing then. Uh, and so I get to see their data in a different, even though it's from basically the same database and same format, um, how it's used a little differently. So, so that's been really fascinating to me to get to see the, the variations. And I think another thing, you know, looking back at that time, um, you know, I was an Oregonian working on an or a system for Oregon, I'd only ever voted through the mail. Uh, and so that was certainly my worldview. Uh, that has certainly expanded, uh, as you know, as you all know, um, systems are completely different and, and how people vote is very different across the nation, which is part of what, you know, we're experiencing right now is, is people having to think about it differently there. But at ERIC, we take in voter registration data and DMV data. We produce reports back to our election, um, the administrators that are members. Uh, so now I get to see how people have really thought about their systems, and yet I'm asking them to give me a standard format. And so asking them to, to look at their systems and uh, still come up with kind of the same concepts. And you really see how people have done it differently across the nation. Um, there's, there's different flavors for sure. I mean, even just down to simple things like how they enter addresses uh, can be very different in different regions um, and how they even uh, assign addresses to a property. So. <laughs> I don't want to let everyone know um, at the end of the video, we're going to be listing the URLs, including Eric and other places where people can get from more information. And Steve, I'd like to turn back to you. Um, you know, we we're going to be listing the URL for the report. And of course, we encourage our viewers to look and dig down into that. Um, but process moving forward. So we've done what we described at the time as a pilot report. Um, and that was because of some of the, uh, we encountered in the system some ways that we'd like to get access um, more easily and quickly than we were able to. And to be fair, uh, the, the comparison project we had in Orange County, well, we, we had uh, Neil Kelly in Orange County. Neil can make a lot of decisions for his county that you're unable to make because you have to navigate through a number of different counties at the statewide level. But if you could highlight two or three things that you uh, thought were the most important lessons from the report, and then talk us through a little bit about the process moving forward. Where are you going now? Um, you know, not only are we in the midst of a pandemic and, and you're in the midst of an election uh, process right now, everyone here on the call is, 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 has either returned their ballots or the ballots are sitting on the kitchen table, um, so is this the time to move forward now? Um, is, the, is the time after uh, 2020? Sort of walk us through a little bit about what you learned and, and what the lessons are for moving forward for both in Oregon and any state that's thinking about modernizing these systems that were put in place now, as Erica says, that are now reaching teenagerhood. And, and we want to get them on the right track before they enter adulthood. Absolutely. And I think uh, you know, one of the big takeaways for me you know, election administration today, you know, different than 20 years ago is, uh, you know, really needs to be data driven. And uh, the more data we have, um, the better data we have, the faster data transfers we have, the better jobs we can do and, and the more security we can, we can maintain. And, and so there's just a lot of benefits to having good data and being able to use that to make decisions and to plan and to, and to react. And so, um, you know, I think the report showed that we've got, um, you know, we've got good data in our database. It's just an old database. And, and so there's a lot of things that we would like to do that uh, we really can't just because of the age of it. Um, you know, I, I use it, uh, I've got a daughter that just turned 16 as well. Um, with the pandemic, she's not able to get her driver's license because DMV is closed. And so she's a little bit upset still. But, um, you know, I use it, uh, you know, if I've got a 2005 car, um, it still gets me to work and, and back or it'll take her to school and back, um, but it doesn't have a lot of the modern, uh, you know, security or safety features or, um, or convenience features, doesn't have a backup camera, um, doesn't have extra airbag bags, doesn't have a uh, Bluetooth connection. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of new technology and new features that uh, exist today that didn't exist back then. And I think that's the same challenge we have with our current database. Um, it gets the job done, but there's a lot of things that could be done better, a lot of efficiencies that could be gained, and I think that was really highlighted in the report. Uh, and so, um, you know, it, it's, it's good to be able to see those things and, and uh, to be able to know what we need to be able to do to get to the next step. So, what is the next step? And, and I think, uh, you know, following up on, on Erica's comments, we've all learned a lot since the last time that we had to go through one of these. And, and uh, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, a lot of the discussion is, well, we'll just, we'll just modernize 
the current OCVR system. And, and uh, I'm trying to keep away from that. Uh, you know, we're kind of coming into this with the mindset of if we were starting from scratch today, what would we build to take advantage of 21st century technology and the tools that are available today? And so that's, we've, we've started on this path um, so that we can have, uh, you know, more constant data transfers, more secure, um, lots of, uh, you know, be able to take advantage of, of new tools and, and new technology that uh, just weren't available 15, 16 years ago. And so, um, you know, that's the exciting piece of this. Um, we got some federal funds that uh, don't come very often. And so we want to highlight that and take advantage of these one-time funds to take a shot at building a system that will get us into the 2030s. And, uh, you know, that's exciting and scary at the same time. You know, as you say, we're in the middle of uh, the primary here is, uh, you know, in a week and a half, um, in the middle of a presidential year, uh, cybersecurity concerns all around and in the middle of a pandemic. So um, I must be crazy to be pushing forward with, uh, with trying to build a new system. You know, frankly, it's probably going to take us three years to be able to get, uh, to get a new system and roll that out to hopefully in 2023. Um, but we're starting now and, and uh, taking advantage of some of the things Erica mentioned as far as building requirements and, and what do we want the new system to do? You know, what's our, you know, what's our dream system? And uh, let's gather those requirements and then we'll figure out what we can really afford and what we can really pull off. Steve, I think I'm going to take advantage of a follow up here. You, you talked a little bit about, you know, the Oregon Centralized Voter Registration System, the OCVR. Um, now, looking across the landscape in the U.S., uh, if you had some words of wisdom uh, for other election administrators thinking about all oh, the raft of challenges ahead, but then also how to manage that data or think um, how to be more um, aggressive in modernizing that data, what would, what would be your recommendations? Well, I mean, I think, you know, especially, you know, I'm getting tons of calls from states all over the country asking about vote by mail. And one of the things that they don't anticipate is the quality of the data in your database. And because we're vote by mail, um, you know, we're sending a couple of pieces of, of election mail to, uh, to registered voters every year. And so if somebody moves or, you know, something happens, we get notified of that. And so we can keep the records clean. Um, there's a financial incentive to, to do that for vote by mail state, because we only want to pay the mail. We only want to pay to mail the ballot out once. Um, if it's the wrong address, then we pay to mail it to the wrong address. We pay for it to come back from the wrong address, telling it's the wrong address. And then we pay a third time out to the new address. And so, um, you know, having clean data is important and being able to have tools that allow you to interact with whether it's your DMV, whether it's ERIC, whether it's the National Change of Address System. Um, those are all key components in your voter registration database that uh, can help you have cleaner data, which then helps you to have a more efficient and, and more cost-effective election. And Steve, I want to say we, um, at, at EVIC, we've been having some of these same discussions and some of the things we encountered um, as we went through the audit report and uh, no criticism of Erica. Erica, if you want to chime in in a moment, but you know, there's certain things that we wanted to get as um, outside observers that uh, were not uh, available in the statewide system. You know, many of the counties are quite advanced now in terms of their signature verification systems, the processing of, um, of the by mail ballots. We've had a number of wonderful interactions with Tim Scott, who's the director of elections in Multnomah County, who's walked us through multiple times processing that they have. So here's a case where the technology for processing the by mail ballots has really advanced and the statewide system um, ha has not kept up. Perhaps that's not the right word, but the capacity was not anticipated in 2002, 2003, 2004, but the kind of information that's being captured now. And you can imagine if you have equity concerns of, for example, signature verification, you'd like to be able to see at a statewide level what's going on there. And so I don't know, Erica, if you have any thoughts on, on what you might do now if you could wind back in time and anticipate some of the really dramatic changes that have occurred. Well, for sure you can't, I mean, you just can't imagine what will happen 10 years from now and considering how much uh, change we've seen already. But the thing that I really was happy to hear Steve say is, is they're gonna take a long time to really understand their requirements. And I, if I could give one piece of advice on that level, it's, it's really to think with the end in mind. Think about how you might collect data, what the kind of things you might want to know about your, your information. Um, 
Because like one of the things that we did with OCBR is there were reports from all over the state and they put them in a big pile and said, make our reports. And the reports were kind of a mess because it was trying to make sure that we got everybody's report that looked exactly like the thing they were used to having rather than kind of wiping the board and saying, no, what do you need to know about your data? And, and writing a report that really hit to that. So understanding what you might want to under, you know, look at in your data um, and, and make that part of your requirements and really put some analysis to that. I think that's one of the most key things. Um, and then, you know, a little bit of, and, and admittedly, um, when I work at Eric, I'm really a jack of all trades, an expert at none. I wish that I had time to do a lot more about big data and understanding that. I think there are definitely resources out there that can understand like data modeling and, and how you really do data analysis that could be applied here now that are out there. Um, and, and I think that could be part of your, your requirements really. But, but taking that time to understand what you really want, I think especially now um, because we're down the road enough that we, I think states understand what they need more. They know the core of their system so much better than they were when they were kind of guessing what they might want um, when we were first in the Hava space. Um, now they can you know, define that succinctly and also expand the horizons a little bit to think about these other things like security and accessibility and, uh, and data analysis. So I'm hoping that that's, that'll be part of it. You know, the reality of you're always, always doing things just in time, um, you will have to have some give and take. That's just, you know, something we have to accept as, as you know, systems are designed. But um, taking that time to really think about what you want and what you need and what you might want to understand out of it afterwards. So Steve, I, I see you're desperately waving your hand there electronically. You wanted to follow up a little bit? No, I, you know, it, it's almost like Erica and I worked together before, but, um, you know, I, I just right. think that, uh, you know, as, as we move forward, you know, and especially talk about these new systems, um, you know, the data standardization becomes much more important. And, uh, um, and um, I think, you know, it gives us an opportunity to then bring in academics and others from the outside to do a lot of this research um, and, and analysis that we frankly don't have the resources or, or expertise or, or funds to do and, and helps, you know, the entire process. You know, I can't, I can't remember how many times you and I have talked about, Paul, um, you know, I wish we could do some study about why people return ballots the way they do, whether they go to a drop box or whether they go through the mail or whether they return on the first weekend or the last weekend. Um, and so by coming up with, you know, some data standardization, um, it will be a lot easier. And I think, you know, looking at what we're doing now compared to back 15, 16 years ago, we were going from 36 separate counties that all did their own systems and all did them differently um, and in their own way and trying to bring that into one state system. Now that we've had a state system for, um, you know, for this period, it's not going to be as big of a change with the counties to get them to standardize, you know, naming conventions, um, you know, addresses, um, you know, how they're entering data. And so I think that's really going to help us to get better data, um, to have it more clean. And I think, you know, one of the, you know, one of the analogies I also use is that, uh, you know, when you look at OCBR, um, it was created before the iPhone. Um, you know, do you want to go back to your old uh, Motorola Razor flip phone um, from 2005? That's really what we're driving um, with the election administration. It still works. Um, we can still make calls, but uh, doesn't have nearly the apps or the functionality or the, or the fancy cameras that you would get now. What makes you think I've upgraded? <laughs> so listen, I want to... It was the collective upgrade. <laughs> Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, you know, we're going to have a closing sort of round robin section here. I want to give each of our speakers uh, a chance to reflect on how uh, the one thing that they may be paying attention to, how they think we can work to assure a safe, secure, and resilient election system in November beyond. So I'm going to start with you, Paul Manson, um, and I'll give a little bit of preview here. So Paul's other hat that he wears is on disaster preparedness and disaster resiliency. So I don't know, Paul, if you'd like to speak to that or something else, but I'll hand it off to you. We'll follow up uh, with Erica, uh, finally, Steve, and, and then I'll do a closing comment. Sure, thanks, Paul. You know, I, I definitely think from that disaster perspective, one of the uh, lessons we know uh, from disasters in general outside of election uh, impacts is that we're um, sometimes lulled into worrying about the most likely bad news, the most likely bad case versus the worst case. 
Um, and the data quality is such a huge part of that story. So as we've modernized these systems and as we can better access them, um, just as we think about what the possible impacts are about increasing the shift to vote by mail or vote at home, uh, data will drive that conversation. And so I can definitely see where those states or jurisdictions that have access, in-house access to that sort of data analytic power um, will have one experience very different than those that can't. And so um, that's part of this conversation going forward and how we respond to COVID is, is the applied data analysis with the tools that are on hand. Erica, uh, anything you're looking at or worried about or hopeful about for 2020 as we're in this very complicated period? <laughs> well, it's everything, right? That's, that's the hard thing. How do I distill it down to one? Um, well, when I was thinking about this uh, with this conversation, I was really thinking about states that are looking to, to, to update their systems uh, or maybe replace their systems. And I, I think one thing that hasn't changed is, is the user experience, right? So remembering to talk to those people who are all the way down using your system um, as you're thinking about a new one. Um, and I think that still is gonna apply. They're gonna have whole new experiences through this kind of crazy time, but making sure you talk to the people, your end users, um, they're really gonna know the dirt of how your system could work better. And so, so have those conversations and, and make it part of your requirements analysis. And Steve, you're up. Well, you know, it's it's just an interesting time, and and uh, you know, even though um, you know it's kind of elections as usual in Oregon for the for the voters' perspective, um, we're continuing to have to plan. And I think you know when we talk about data, um, all of us throughout the country are are learning about uh, PPE, the the personal protective equipment, um, and none of us really know the answers to you know how many gloves is someone going to use per day. And so how many are you going to need during the election? And so we're gonna be gathering data and, and information as we do this for the first time that will help to guide us for November um, so that we've got uh, a better, you know, we can make better estimates. Right now it's, it's really a shot in the dark because we don't have any data to guide us. And so we've got to gather that data that will then help us to be better and, and be more efficient. And so, um, you know, just another example of no matter what you're preparing for or planning for, Having good data helps you to make a better informed decision. Well, Steve, that's a wonderful handoff, and thank you for closing with that. That's some of the conversations we're having, we're trying to continue to have in the Resilient Election Talk Series about how election administrators can potentially reach out to academics, find partnerships um, that can help them prepare better for 2020, but really beyond, as Steve and Erica both referred to, look, this is uh, an unusual situation, but we want to learn the right lessons from the situation as we move forward to 2021, 2022. So thank you. We'll put URLs and contact information for everyone um, on our closing screen. Please follow us uh, at, at early underscore vote, uh, evic.read.edu. Um, also the Caltech Voting Technology Project. We might wish Mike Alvarez the best. He's a bit under the weather. Um, he'll be back on some of our future videos. So thanks everyone. Um, and we'll see you next time.